But check this out. If you guys wasn't here last week, Brother Call, I had Brother Call, you know, give the message. And I went back and listened to the message because, you know, it, it's exactly what and where God has me. It's pretty amazing. And listen, I'm just give you a quick review of what Call said last week if you wasn't here so you'll understand. This was Brother Call's message in a nutshell. Call said that he's not a pastor or a preacher, but a helper. Wow. A helper. Yeah. Man. You're going to find out that that is more important than anything. Especially when it comes to peace. That's right. He said, uh, Call said he's not a pastor or a preacher, but a helper. And when he comes to church, he comes to see how he can serve. Amen. Wow. Amen. That should be the mentality of everyone. Amen. Amen. Don't worry about that bee. That bee's okay. He don't sting on good Sabbath. So, listen again. Carl said he's not a pastor or a preacher, but a helper. And when he comes to church, he comes to see how he can serve. That needs to be the mentality of everyone. Yeah. How can I help? You know, um, I got this message this past week from my brother about me ministering at the jail. And he had told me that Pete said, you know, maybe God has given your, your brother a break so they can step in and pick up a ministry that I began. That's right. That is like, where can I help? That's Pete. And Jason, look, I'll step in for you so that you can go on and do something else. Not that I'm out of it, no. you know, but that's the mentality of he rec Pete recognized that I have other things I could be doing and serving in and that they can fulfill that position. Yeah. So, you know, that was really uh, amazing. I watched my mom walk in today. And she didn't come in empty-handed. She walked in with a, you know, I got a big case of water that's in a, uh, that's in a vehicle. Can you go get it and bring it in here? That's serving. Yeah. Serving the need of the body. It's going to be a really good message today. And, man, you guys are a good garden. You really are. So, uh... It's going to be good. He says, then, it, then uh, Carl says, um, he then shares a vision about him, you know, being taken above the world and now um, we now live in in. And the first thing he wonders is he was surprised that God could see him through all of that. Yes. You know, and, he, and Carl had said, man, he realized that it was, man, I was really about self. You know, and he said, um, he goes on to talk about uh, loving the Lord God with all his heart and serving Him. That's his heart. He said, when I come to church, I just want, I come not to get anything, but where can I help and where can I serve? That's Carl, beyond the shadow of a doubt. He'll get in and fill in, and that's many of you. I'm not just singling any one individual out, but he was sharing his heart. Man, what, what can I do? Where do you need me? And that has to be what the body is about. How can I serve the other part? Um, he also talked about offenses and how they come and the importance of keeping yourself guarded from them because it causes sickness. Amen. You know, it'll cause you to be sick. Yeah. He also said that, um, then he talks about the works of the flesh and, uh, you know, it produces selfishness. You know, sometimes we go to church and because something maybe wasn't ministered that you liked or, you know, you really focus everything around you what, and what you can get and what you can receive, right? Amen. But he said, he comes back and says, but the gifts of the Spirit is selfless. Why? Because the gifts of the Spirit are for others and not for you. That's right. It's not your gift. Right. You don't own it. You're just, God uses you as a conduct, a Amen. conduit. Amen. to use that gift through you. And that gift is actually for others. Yeah. But when you hold back your gifts, then you're holding back the hand of God. Amen. You're cutting yourself off from receiving as well. Amen. Because you become a block conduit. And then you'll die. It'll kill you. Nobody will want to be around anyone that, you know, doesn't want to flow and give off. Amen. That's right. You have nothing to give. I mean... It just produces death. 
Um, he says, uh, how do you respond? He also said, how do you respond to offenses? You know, we'll, we'll actually let you know how mature you are or not. I ain't going back to that church no more. Mm -hmm. Man, you could forget that. Usually offended people travel to a lot of different churches. Yeah. And the next church they go to, they talk about the former one they were at. Right. And that's usually fruitless people. That's right. Twice dead, plucked up by the root, and wherever they go, they bring dead fruit. Yes. Um, so he said, you can handle this offense, he says, you can, by the fruit of the flesh or by the fruit of the spirit. Now listen, I was offended many a times. God kept me to stay with a man for a year so that he could speak to him. And this guy was constantly trying to get me. And I wanted to leave, you know, but I said, you know what? The Lord didn't tell me to leave because he wanted to teach me something in it. Yes. Threw me in the midst of the briar patch. Getting stuck all over the place. You know? Before, because he had, he had something that he wanted to do in that briar patch. Or wherever it is that God places us and sends us. You know, so people who are in, easily offended are usually um, selfish and very immature. Offenses will come, the Lord says, but it's how you handle those offenses. Amen. Right? Um, also, he said, holding on to offenses causes constipation. Yes. <laughs> a blockage. Right? It does. Yep. You hold on to it, bubble. You got to let it go. Right? But he said, confession causes healing. Amen. You know? So, also, um, he also said that. You know, one of the important things, Jesus said, my food is to do the will of the one who sent me. Yeah. And then, you know, his food is to do the will of the one that sent him. That's right. right. To do his will, not yours, but mine. His will, his food. That's right. Right? And then, question mark, is this your food? Because everybody has a purpose for being here today. Yeah. And you have mature, and you have immature, and you have those that are in between. It's a growing process in which we live in, right? We don't have, you know, and in God's garden, there's also, you know, people that are prideful. The devil, Lucifer, Satan, plants people in the house of God. That's right. For a reason and a purpose, so that he can contaminate the other seed. That would be like a thorn in the flesh of the church. But how do you handle that thorn? Right? It's there to buffet you, to make you stronger. Because in your weakness, he is strong. Amen. Amen. Wow. Does he say uproot it? No, he does not. He said, but the angels in the end and the harvest will uproot those. Because if you try to uproot a loved one of someone that's there, you hurt them. So God is the gardener. Right? So you have to live with, Amen. like Paul, that thorn in your flesh. Amen. That buffets you. You know, but it's only there to make you stronger. Then he spoke about reading his Bible and talking to God. He said, man, the way I read my Bible is I just, I get up, I, and just so happened, you know, I get up and I stand up and I just begin, you know, to talk to the Lord, maybe about something I read. Now he's in communion. He's fellowshipping with the Word. He's communing with the Father. The song we just heard was, In the Quiet You Are Speaking. Normal people who read get in quietness. And they read their Word so they can hear the Lord speak back to them. Right? And then after that, you know, he called Jason up and Jason talked about repentance. That's what he talked about. Repenting. When you do, you know, when you really... Sometimes you can't see your error. The only way the error can be revealed to you is through the Word. Amen. Sometimes it takes God to use a person to reveal it to you by His Word. Yeah. Or... It can you be reading. And you can see, man, I was wrong. So Jason talked about repentance and how God has him in the beginning teaching about the garden. Pretty amazing. Because that's where we're at right now. 
It's about, you know, if you want to know the season that you're in right now, ride down a road and look, you're going to see, you're going to see all kind of prune stuff out by the road in different places. You're going to see the grounds all disked up. So it's sowing time. People are going to receive the word right now. You know, new life is coming forth, you know. Um, the time we're in right now is about garden or gardening. Um, disking and cultivating and turning the soil, planting and pruning, composting and feeding. Wow. You know, you got to be fed. If you're not fed, you'll die. Amen. Okay? It's easy to get selfish in the cold, wintry weather, the dead season. And God is now tending to His garden. And you are one of the trees in God's garden. So Dawn... You know, we just come out of this, you know, cold, wintry, nothing growing. You know, it's hard, wintry. You know, you tend to get thorns and thistles during that time. You tend in your life to kind of get hard. You know, because why? Because number one, you don't fertilize in the winter. Usually the gardens are covered or, you know, they'll wait to cultivate it. Nothing grows really in the winter time. But the winter time is a time where the roots grow. Ah, I learned that from Charlene. It's root growing time in the winter because you have to hold on. All the life of the tree goes down into the roots and the roots get bigger and thicker and extend out. So when it comes pruning time, we're going to see how deep your roots grow. <laughs> are you strong or are you weak? But then it goes back to the gardener. And a true gardener won't put, you know, I was going to have a chainsaw up here and I was, was going to go after a tree with it. You know? But a true gardener won't hit you with a chainsaw. He won't tear you up or tear you apart. He'll just prune the dead things off of you so that you can grow and produce more fruit. Amen. And we're going to get into that and see it. Um, um, let's see. Um, you'll want to, uh, God's trees in the garden. For the church as a whole, um, for the church as a whole, it's pruning time. And for us to reject pruning would be to reject growth. Wow. For us to reject pruning would be to reject growth. Yes. yes. Right? Yes. Pruning produces strength and stability, which causes fruitfulness. This is just a general write-up that I've done. I'm going to give you some scriptures of uh, some really good stuff. And number say, if you're not fruitful, the seed is within the fruit. So, the seed is within the fruit, and if there's no fruit, well, then there's no seed. So, if you don't allow God to prune you when you're wrong, well, then you're rejecting the hand of God in your life. Also, growing fast will produce death on a young tree. This is what I'm doing in my yard right now. Pruning my trees, my fruit trees. I pruned them all back. While I was doing it, the Lord started speaking to me. This is what I want you to talk about. Because this is where I'm at. God gives us the natural things so that we can understand the things of the Spirit. Right? So you're going to find, through this message, you're going to be pruned today. But you're going to be pruned by God, not by me. And some people are like, oh... What's he going to tell us? Nothing. <laughs> the Bible says the righteous, the righteous prunes herself. Yeah. My brother. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> wow. The righteous don't need somebody pruning on them because they allow the Word of God to prune them. Amen. There's only one pruner, and that's God the Father. Amen. Also, growing too fast will produce death on a young tree because the fruit draws too much life from the root and the stem. 
literally sucks the life out of it because it can't not, it cannot supply what all the new fruit is requiring let me man the Lord spoke majorly to me right here this church exploded when we got started we went up to a hundred and twenty people yeah yeah we had to get 40 new chairs besides the 83 gold ones we had. Man, and I remember Alan, Pastor Alan, telling me, when you get started, man, I hope you don't grow too quick. Mm. I know about that now. And I've learned that, you know, I remember when Elroy came next door to my house and I just planted a pear tree, my neighbor Elroy. And man, it was beautiful long had a couple little bitty fruits hanging on the top and sticking out and there's leaves all over it I said man Elroy look at this that tree man this little tree I got is gonna do awesome he said you know what you got to do with that tree I said what and he grabbed his hand and went Thank you. and broke it off I'm like oh! he said now to live I'm like what he broke the top out of that tree. Cut the top out of it. He said, that tree with all those leaves and those fruits that are hanging on it, little bitty pears, yeah. cracked it off. Yeah. He said, that would have killed that tree right there. You'd have never got the fruit out of that tree. That tree is alive today and big. Yeah. And fruit all over it. Well, buds all over it. I just pruned it again. But now it ain't a massive stem. It's shot out like this. And my wife just told me about a house. Are you sure you got that trellis in the right way? Because that pear tree is like going to get big. <laughs> because it was pruned. <laughs> and through it, I learned. When I, I, I got seed from a 100-year-old plus, a 100-plus-year-old melaton. Louisiana melaton. Melaton. Oh, oh, yeah. I just planted them. Uh -oh. I was told, and I looked it up, that the melaton will grow like massive and spread out. But they, it, it, they said, make sure you prune it back because yep. it'll outgrow itself and kill itself. The fruit will draw so much from it that the seed will die. I remember the first time which this church, when it grew, the Lord, little did I know, wanted to prune it. How did he prune it? Through his word. Mm -hmm. So I want to bring forth some revelation that God showed me. <clears throat> and I'm like, man, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if the people are going to be able to handle this. <laughs> yeah. How many people I was told to me, man, you know, you start talking about that stuff, you can forget it. You're going to lose some people. And I did. Come on, brother. He cut the top out of the citadel. Yes, he did. Mm -hmm. And then he told me, you know, talk about this. And I'm like, oh, Lord. No, change the service from Sunday to Friday. Yeah. Ooh, you're going to chop it again. Why? Wow. <laughs> Son, that tree was looking like this. <laughs> I'm like, Lord, we only standing on one lane right now. Uh -huh. He said, all right, take it from Friday, go to Saturday, cut the all the leg up. Man, it looked like a stump. I mean, that was nothing but a stick sticking up and a, and a leaf on it. Yeah. <laughs> Are we even alive? He said, no, but it was that time our roots. Yes. We went through some stuff. Yeah. Amen. And let me tell you something. The ones that were chopped off was the ones that was draining us. Amen. They sucked all the money out of the bank. Everything. Wow. Everything. Wow. $1,500 here to pay for tickets. Rent paying for different people every single month. Mm -hmm. Guess what? As soon as the rent stopped and stopped paying electric and stopped doing this and that, gone. Whoa. Why? You can't give me. Yeah. Exactly. You can't support and give me. You call it a shakening. Every time, every time he said we're going yeah. to church. We're going to church. That's right. As Cherie said, I called it that God is going to shake this church. Yeah. I remember the last time when he said go to Saturday. I thought it was funny. All right, we changed it. Oh, you can't even make a... I got called in by another pastor on it. Are you all right? <laughs> you're going to have people all messed up. You don't know whether you're having on Sunday or Friday or Saturday. Are you going to change it again? The big thing, remember the big thing was because the, you kept telling them the Lord said, and they were coming to you by the droves. What, the Lord changes his mind? Right. 
That's what they didn't understand. You know, it, it's so, you know. But it was God's. <laughs> it's the way through his word that he prunes back, yeah. you know, so that the ones that are there can get stronger. Amen. Yeah. Yes. I was just thinking, um, we were talking about, you know, the dormant time for the plant, the roots grow. Well, that's also a time where the buds are forming within the branches. And if you wait and prune at the wrong time and prune after those buds are already forming inside the branches, you lose your fruit, essentially. The yeah. fruit won't come forth because you just cut off the, wrong place. the bud. So... Yeah. If you wait to go with your correction and stuff like that, you're going to lose your fruit. Wow. Basically, is what it was speaking to me, anyway. Wow. So that's, and that goes back to a right time and a wrong time right. yeah. to prune. So the pruning time actually is when the sap is still down in the tree and the blood is not up in its roots because at that time you throw it in the shock. What do you mean? You know, and you, you'll mess it up. So, I mean, if we can just look around at us naturally, you know, we're coming out of a hard time. We're coming out of time that, you know, you don't want to go to church. It's winter time. We're coming out of time we looked in here, that's nine people. <laughs> if springtime's coming, we taken out, got to take some chairs out. It is really good to see you. You know, it's, it's hard in a winter time, but you have to remain. And that's what we're going to get in today. You have to remain. Amen. You have to abide. Yes. And that's what it's about. For me, uh, and all of this is just a build up to um, so you know when God wants to do something, you know, I can't tell you how much stuff I went through during those times. Mm. You know, I don't have uh, one tenth of the problems I had back then. Mm. And um, you know, I had the, the vine telling the tree, you know, and he's, res anyway. <laughs> this is where God steps in and ever so gently prunes and even cuts the top out of the tree so that the stem can grow thick and handle the new fruit. Why is that? Because as just a little stem starting, I can only give to so many. I can only supply the need for so many. But when you have the heart, and you walk in the door and you say, hey, how can I serve? Amen. Well, we have some fruit, some young fruit that needs help, that needs training, that needs whatever it is. That's where we all come together and say, hey, I want to be a contributor, or I want to be a part of what's happening here, so that the majority that walks in you don't have 15% serving and 85% sucking the life out of everyone. And that's how it is in, in the majority of the churches right. today. You know? But whatever it is that God has gifted you or blessed you in, you know, we all need it one from another. That's why I love Wednesday nights. You know, Charlene has an open forum. Yeah. She talks, and then everybody can input, and we can all learn from one another. I love it. You know, and I can ask pruning times in Charlene's life. I done heard of many of them. In my mama's life, I've heard many of, you know, you know, where, you know, when you, I mean, in some of these, they've been called out, you know, from the Baptist Theological Seminary and brought to the front and passes all over, and they want to hack you up and prune you right there. But you know what? They didn't, isn't, that isn't God. That's their way of, you know, supposedly pruning. And I'm going to talk about, you know, th stuff like that because they're really the blind ones and they don't even know where they're swinging, right. you know? Amen. But anyway, and I'm not talking about the Baptists by no means. I'm just in general, I can't. you know? No. <laughs> I'm sorry. The Lord, um, it says, uh, you know, and that's what's good about church. He can, you know, it's good. A person that is mature, and the Lord says, how can I supply for the need of the new tree? How can I supply? How can I help? You know, and I, I, I got to commend Carl again. That he understands. And not that none of you don't. Because many of you do. 
you know, he understands. He don't want to be tied down in one area. That's what Carl tells me all the time. I don't want to be locked down in one area. I want to teach Zechariah how to do this to help you know fill that position. I'll do this and help that and. You know, I just, I got the gift of helps, and I want to help any kind of way I can, even if I don't know how. I'll fill a position until somebody else can take it from me. That's him, you know. Um, a person that is mature in the Lord says, how can I supply for the need of the new tree? An immature, immature person says, feed me, feed me. And when they're not fed what they want, uh, and when they're not fed what they want, they throw a tantrum and they leave. That's right. Yeah. You know, that's... And the Lord wanted me to question is, where are you? Yeah. So the question is, where are you? And this is for you, you know, to... You know, to... Uh, just look at yourself. Yeah. See where you are. Do you feel that... You know, you're supplying or you're not supplying. And let me tell you something about supply. Is it's easy to, to supply in your gifting. If you're gifted to do something, it's easy to supply in it. It's when you're asked to do something else or called to do something else that you don't like doing is where you grow. Yeah. Submission and obedience. And we're going to get into that. So I want to take you to, um, we're going to go to John chapter 15. Open your Bibles. I hope you brought your Bibles, the Word. And I want to read to you from John chapter 15. And I have a brand new NASB I am so excited about. I just said yesterday I'm going to buy one. And one was given to me this morning. Thank you, sister. Charlene, the Bible lady. Um, subjecting yourself to pruning. You know, um, so I want to read John chapter 15 to you. And, um, and we're going to go from there. So in the King James Version, and I have them both, King James is what I've been studying out my whole life. Um, but I got an NASB, which is closest to the original text that I hear now, and it really, it really is, because I translate all the words to Hebrew to Greek, and it says it plain in the, in the, in the NASB. But um, let's, uh, let's read real quick. All right. And I'm going to start in uh, John chapter 15. Um, now, before I start in John chapter 15, if you flip your Bible to John chapter 13, you're going to find out that this is right at the Lord's Supper. Um, this is when Christ is about to die. And we know He died at Passover in the springtime. So this message that He's ministering is in the springtime when he's foreshadow talking about what's about to come. So John chapter 15 is all in the end. You understand? Actually, if we really got technical, if you guys remember this message the Lord had showed, told me, if we went all the way back to John chapter uh, 2, I think it was. Yes. Um, you remember, if, if, if I take you all the way back to John chapter 2, in verse 13, everything from John chapter 2 all the way to the end of John is all right at his death. That's right. Wow, I'm going to show you how. Real quickly, look at verse 13 in John chapter 2. It says, And the Jews' Passover was nigh at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. And he found in the temple those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money sitting. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them out of the temple uh, and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers' money and overthrew the tables. And I'm going to stop right there. This was four days before he died. 
everything from John chapter 2 all the way to the end. And let me tell you something. I read it and studied it. It blew me away when he showed it to me. A lot of, in Matthew and in Luke, you hear in the beginning, or, you know, or actually at the end, you can go to the end of the book and you're going to see. Now watch this. I'll prove it to you. If you go to chapter 12, verse 12 through 15. So we're going to leave chapter 2 of John. And we're going to go now to John chapter 12. You're going to see that everything was happening was at that time. It says the triumphal entry. John chapter 12, verse 12. So the triumphal entry is when Christ cleansed the courts. Look at this. John chapter 12, verse 12. On the next day, much people that were, uh, come to the feast... When they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And Jesus, when he had found a young ass, he sat upon it. All right, and he goes and he says, um, let me keep, let me get up here. Um, I hope I'm in the right place. Hold on, hold on. <coughs> through 15. Anyway, I'm about to come back to that. Wait, no, it's here. Jesus rides in and see if you see it anywhere in, uh, in verse 12. Remembered. We're looking for when he cleansed the... Uh, When he came riding in, he cleansed them. He cleansed the house. He keep. I don't have to come back to that. Let me get away from that. I'm gonna come back to it, and I'll correct myself after the message is over. I'll show it to you. But anyway, um, let's get back to John chapter 15, and um, and I want to read it to you. He says, um, John chapter 15, verse one. He says, um, "I am the true vine." And my father is the husbandman. That means he's the, the gardener. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh it away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he prunes it. Right? He prunes it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now, ye are clean, ye are pruned, the Bible says. Now ye are pruned through the word which I have spoken unto you. Now, listen to this. If you don't read the word, you're not pruned. Come on, brother. If you don't read the word of God, where well, you're not subjecting yourself unto the Father to prune you. Right. You understand that? So if you don't read the word, you're unpruned. And you got wild stuff growing all over you. Wow. But if you read the Word, the Word will show you where you need to be pruned. He says, Now ye, verse 3, Now ye are pruned or made clean through the Word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye accept, no more can ye accept ye abide in the vine. So let me just look at that. Come on, bro. That word abide in the Greek means to remain. Amen. So un unless you remain in God's word, you're not being pruned. You'll have your opinion right. about things. Yeah. But it's wrong. That's right. And you're blind. Amen. Abide in the Greek means to remain. Right. It's the word meno. It means to stay in a given place. Wow. You know how many people that I've talked to about the Word of God, oh, God. and got offended and left? Mm -hmm. 
They didn't abide. They didn't remain. Watch. It means to stay in a given place or a state of relation or expectancy. So being here, you know, I expect you to stay. Not me, God. God expects you to remain so that He can prune you so that you can grow and produce fruit. God expects you to give. Yes. God expects you to produce. Amen. Not me. His Word. It means to abide. To continue. To dwell. To endure. It means that you have to endure his pruning. Because if you pull a tree up while I'm leaving here and you go plant a tree in another body down the street, it ain't producing no fruit. It throws it in a shock. That's right. The only fruit it has is bad. And it spreads its bad fruit everywhere it goes. Come on. I remember when the Lord told me when I was in a body. And I didn't agree with everything that was going on. He said, bloom where I've planted you. Right. Bloom where I've planted you. So I dug in deep and could have left them many a times and was offended many a times. Amen. You know, getting poked and stuck and prided at. But you know what? I'm not leaving until God says for me to leave. Yeah. And during a job for a year with a man that God wanted to reach. And if I'd have left as soon as he offended me, I would have, God would have never been able to do the work in that man that he wanted to do. But first, it wasn't just for the man. It was to teach me to remain even though you're getting prodded and poked and stuck. Amen. Paul prayed about it three times. Amen. Take this from me. I'm quitting it. No. No, you're not. Thorns and thistles grows in the garden. Right? It means, it means to stay in a given place or a state of relation or expectancy, to abide, to continue, to dwell, to endure, to be present. God expects you to be here. I only went through two verses. To remain, to stand, to tarry for a spot for your own. Well, let's see about this. Okay, there is a, there is a, um, thank you, brother. Um, there's a big long line, and we want tickets to get in to the line of the tribe of Judah, to the New Jerusalem. How long are you going to stay and remain? Because you've got to stay and remain till you get to the gate and you're issued what it is that you need to get in. If you get out of line, well, you lost your spot. Right. Because you didn't abide, remain, stay, to continue, to stand fast, to endure. How many people's up there? A hundred! You get out of line, you're finished. You don't get in. You don't get in. And remember, Hebrews says that the shepherd has to give account for you. That means when I get to heaven, God is going to physically and literally ask me about you. I'm telling you what the Bible says. I have to give account for you. Now, how can I give account for you if you're not here? How can I give account for you if I don't know who you are or what you are about? Pretty serious stuff, huh? Because that's what Hebrews says. Obey the ones that have rule over you, for they have to give account on your behalf. It's in Hebrews, I think, chapter 10. So it means to tarry for a spot of your own to be planted. 
Wow. Let's see. God formed Adam out of the dust of the ground, blew the breath of life in him, and take, took him. And the literal word means placed in his garden. He planted him in his garden. And because of disobedience, he was put out of the garden. Therefore, he's no longer in the garden. Wow. So disobedience can get you removed from God's garden. Right? Yeah. Okay, let's keep going. Prune. When you're being pruned, it just simply means to cut back for the purpose of producing more fruit. We all, in, in our way, produce fruit. You know, and we can go in, we can go to Romans chapter 11, because we have been engrafted into Christ. An engraft is when they cut the side of a tree and open it up and engraft something else in it. But if you break it off from that tree, well, then it's going to die. And he talks about that. We've been engrafted, a wild olive branch has been engrafted into a natural olive tree, one that is tame and mature and not wild. And because we've been engrafted into it, it makes that, that, that natural olive tree to produce more fruit because of the engraft. Now watch this. Let's keep reading in uh, 15. He says, um, I am the vine and ye are the branches. He that remains in me and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abides not in me, if a man doesn't stay in him, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered. Amen. And men gather them and cast them in the fire and they are burned. If you don't subject yourself unto Christ and remain and stay in Him, you're a dead branch. Yeah. And you will be picked up at the end and gathered and thrown into the fire. Right? Amen. That means if, you, do you, if you're not producing fruit, then you're dying. Because if you are attached to the vine, to the genuine vine, to Jesus Christ, you're going to be drawing life from it. You can say you're attached to it. You could say that you're close to it. I could cut your arm off and hold it one centimeter from your body. And it's going to die. Why? Because it's not attached. You can say you're a part of. You could say that you're rooted and planted there. But why do they see you all over the place? It's not bad. I'm not talking about fellowshipping with other churches. We need to do that. But usually people that, you know, I know quite a few people that are, you know, they get offended here and they're at this church. Before you know it, I know it, they've been to every church. <laughs> and they ain't got no fruit. They think they have fruit, and they wanna, but they want to bring their agenda. They want to set things up. They want to do this. Oh, they, they might sing good. They might worship good. They might play good. They might preach good. But they're not subjected, submitted. And until you can understand that, until you can learn to be submitted, then you can forget about ever being used by God. Man, and even being submitted under things that, you know, well, I, I don't totally agree with what that brother's saying. If it's not heresy, you know, well then, it, it, you listen, I stayed submitted under a place for a long time, but in that submission, God was teaching me. And although I didn't agree with everything, it's okay because I get my meat. The Bible says the young lions roar after their prey, yeah. but seek their meat from God. Mm. Amen. Ah! Mm. That's where I got my meat from. That's right. I didn't get it in the church. I got it from His Word. And I stayed until I had a dream. 
I had a dream I'm walking down a road and there's watches all over the ground. I bent down and picked these wristwatches up in my dream and I'm like, Lord, man, what does this mean? Instantly I woke up and he said, it's time. <sighs> Submission will make you do crazy things. Amen. <laughs> Not stupid things. Oh, they, they seem stupid to others. But submission will make you do things that will humble you. Because God is trying to get through to you. Submission will say, hey, in worship, Lord, you're so good, Father. Just use me. Lay down on the floor face first. <laughs> oh, Lord, you're so good. <laughs> Lay down on the floor first, first, first face first. Oh, Lord, I know that ain't you. He done confirmed it. He done confirmed it twice. Oh, Lord, they're going to be looking at me, Lord. Yeah. On the floor. Amen. Face first. People like looking. You're like down on the floor. You ain't praying. You're like sweating. Great drop. Oh, I look like an idiot, Lord. <laughs> I'm telling you the truth. You think I'm holy laying on the ground praying and, oh, you're so awesome, Lord. And oh, thank you, Father. You, you're the bestest, Lord. And, and I'm just so holy. And I'm, so, and I'm thinking, oh, do I get up? Like I got dirt on my forehead and my nose. Do I look stupid? The next person is looking at me. <laughs> that's a thing. Man, I'm telling you. That's where it started with me. Stuff like that. That. That's right. Oh Lord, you're so good. Worship. Run around the church. Oh Lord. That, Lord, there's a thousand people up here. Run around the church. Oh, they all gonna be looking at me. You want me to get somebody else to do it? No, Lord. I'm running, making my loops around the church. And then when I get, oh, thank you, Jesus. I'm back to the spot because I don't want to run. That's right. Yeah. I want to stop. Right. And he says, take another lap. Oh my God, Alan's really gonna be looking. Get at me now. <laughs> and Alan's looking at me. And I'm no, I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> People would think I'm crazy. It takes more to run. Then when that moment of reality comes, when the moment of reality hits you. You know, you're in a place you don't want to be. You don't want to be there. But he says, look, I want you to go to the president of the company. And while you're on your way over there, bring a sword. Yeah. Bring a sword? You want me to bring a sword to the guy that wants to fire me and tell me and tell him he don't hear no more. Yeah. But could tell him the story about he, he losing his hearing. How Malchus cut the right ear, I mean, how Peter cut the right ear of Malchus off. I want you to go tell this man that he lost his hearing. I want to speak to him. Man, this guy's going to try to fire me so many times. Lord, he's going to get rid of me. <laughs> so I'm walking out the door and I close the door. And as I close the door, on top of the refrigerator, there's a sword. He said, bring the sword with you. I'm like, oh, yeah, okay. I'm bringing a sword to the office to a guy that doesn't look like me and we all know he doesn't like me and there's contention because I had so much contention and sticking you want me to bring a sword in his office so when I got there the secretary or the office lady was freaking out the vice president he was scared wanting to know what I was doing with a sword <laughs> When I said I had to talk to this man, hey, yeah. <laughs> they would put me in jail now. There's a man in my office with a sword. He wants to talk to me. The cop will show up. Hey, hey. <laughs> but it really is being obedient to the Lord. And I had to go in there. He was so nervous. He couldn't even hear me. I had to put the sword on his desk. <laughs> I said, here, here's the sword. I didn't come here to kill you. I wanted to tell you something. But let me give you a message. <laughs> so I had to tell him about losing your hearing in the garden. And he received it, started crying. Yeah, praise God. Yeah. Got up, closed the door, opened up. The next day, call me, I don't receive none of it. I'm thinking everything's going to be good the next day. 
But it ain't good. The next day he calls me up. I'm not receiving nothing you said. It's all phony and a lie. How can you believe that much revelation about restoring the hearing God is trying to reach to you? That that could be a lie. I mean, come on. He was crying. Mm hmm I'm thinking, oh, thank you, Jesus. He received your word. Golly. He accepted being pruning. It was a sword, too. Oh, my God. I wasn't thinking about, you know, about pruning. But God wanted to prune him. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. He received it. Man, tomorrow, it's gonna, man, if he's going to leave me alone. He's going to understand I love you more than anything. And, and the next day, I get a phone call. Wow. Pruning. Or being obedient is really, being obedient to where it is God has called you. And the last time you guys heard this, in church and worship, I want you to dance all the way up to the front. Oh my God. Never forget it. Never forget it. I'm already looked at as, you know, a crazy man. Crazy. Todd's playing jump, 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 jump. And God says, jump all the way to the front. I'm like, if I jump to the front, everybody's going to be looking at me. Ain't nobody jumping. <laughs> I want you to jump to the front. I'm like, mm. And then you know what he told me? You want me to get somebody else to jump? Yeah, really. Ooh, uh, jump, jump, <laughs> jump, jump. Look like a big idiot. Why? So, for pride. Right. Because of pride. Yes. To humble me. That's yeah. right. Because there's so much pride in us, we don't even realize it. That's right. That's right. When you've been submitted unto the physician's hand, yes. when you've been pruned before, well, that'll make you qualify to prune. That's right. Through his word. Because you'll never prune someone the wrong way. Because right. you know how it feels. I've been hacked on. <laughs> By quite a few. Yeah. And you know what? I probably deserved it. Now, how he did it might have been wrong, but I needed to be pruned. And I was apologized to for, for the pruning the way it happened. But, you know, when I did that little dance, you know, how many people was jumping? There ain't many jumping. And especially when I'm all the way in the back of the church and got to hop, hop, or jump, 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 jump. And then I get to the front, front row. I'm like, oh, thank you, Jesus. He said, go, go jump to the altar. I'm like, the man going to be thinking I'm crazy. Todd's up there playing. He, every time I'm jumping, he's looking at me. Alan's over there looking. What's Todd looking at? And then when I get to the front, I jump up. Now you're in the midst of everybody can see what's happened. You're in the front. There ain't nobody in the front. He wants me to jump all the way to the altar. And he says, put your foot on the altar. Bam. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? No, I just want to humble you a little bit. Yeah. So I can use you. Amen. Right. But if I wouldn't have, you know, listened to him back here and said, jump, 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 jump. Mm -hmm. Then when I got to the front up there, this wouldn't be today. Amen. That's right. And because of that jumping, Amen. this church has opened up. Amen. That's right. At the same time, the Lord said, this is where you're going to sit from now on. That's right. He was bringing me forward. Yes, John. Yeah. How'd you get out of that situation? Did you jump back <laughs> or did you walk back? I mean, how did it work? Well, when I put my foot on the altar... He said, today I'm raising you up. Yeah. Today's a new day. It's a new beginning. Yeah. Today I'm bringing you forward. Mm -hmm. And I was like, you're bringing me forward? I even told my wife, I told Promise, you know, I, I touched the altar and he spoke to me. And when he had said he's raising me up, I went back to the wife. I said, baby, I said, you know, I think the Lord doesn't want us to sit in the back anymore. That's right. He wants us to sit in the front of the church, in the front row. So the following week, we sat in the front row, you know, and, you, you know, I'm like, you know, Alan's over there, Alan's sitting down, you know, we sitting in the front, he, he does this, look. <laughs> <laughs> he even asked you about it, yeah. <laughs> he gets up. Bro. Best to get to the front. What's going on, brother? I said, man, yeah. I just know what the Lord said. He said, the time he's moving me up to the front. There you go. All right. <laughs> now, it wasn't the front row, though. It had nothing to do with the front row. That's right. It was this. He was calling me to the front to pastor. That's right. Right after that, right after that, I had the dreams with the wristwatches, and he said, it's time. Mm -hmm. I said, time for what? 
time for you to shepherd. Time Amen. for you to pastor. That's right. And that's when I went to him. It has nothing to do. I felt weird sitting in the front. I don't never sit in the front of a church. Right. <laughs> never. Sitting way in the back. Why? I love it because I have more room to dance. Amen. Amen. Anyway. It's crazy. So, let me tell you something. They have crazy things, you know, that happen in the church. You know, I'm not, I'm not into getting down on the ground and flopping like a fish and all that kind of stuff. I'm not into all of that stuff. I'm, I'm into what's real. I'm into Jesus Christ. Amen. That's right. And whatever God has to do to humble you, if you submit and subject yourself to it, He'll use you. Um, let me read this to you, and I'm going to end. Um, there's three conditions in a fruitful life that's talked about right here um, in, in John chapter 15. Three conditions of a fruitful life. If you want, you could write these down, or you can you know, catch it off of YouTube or whatever you want. Um, the three conditions of a fruitful life are these. And I'm going to stay in John. It says, uh, Jesus in, in, uh, in verse 2 and 3, he talks about cleansing. When you are in God's Word, it cleanses you. Yeah. Number one. Right? That's what he said in verse 2 and 3. Number two, he talks about remaining. So you're going to have to be cleansed by the Word. If you abide in His Word and remain in His Word, and you are reading His Word, you'll be, God will show you. The righteous purifieth himself, the Bible says, right? So number one is cleansing, verse 2 and 3. Also, it's in John, uh, John 13, 10. Number two is remaining. So these conditions you need to be able to, to be in the Word, to be dwelling in the house of God, planted in His garden. You're going to have to subject yourself to cleansing, pruning. Right? You're going to have to remain. If you get pruned about something, that's not right. And number three, you're going to have to be obedient. And that's verse 10 and 12. Number one, you're going to have to subject yourself to cleaning, cleansing. I'm sorry. You're going to have to remain or abide. And number three, you're going to have to be obedient to what it is that you've been pruned about or talked to about. You understand? There's only one law. And the law of Christ is love. The law of Christ is love. If you love someone... I said this before the week I, I left, too. If someone knows that you love them, they'll receive from you. They'll receive from you. If you don't love them, they're not going to receive anything from you. They're not going to receive nothing from you. And all you'll be doing is just hacking at them and causing offense. Note. You have to remain. To remain in Christ is, on one hand, the center this now. To remain in Christ is, on one hand, to have no known sin in your life that is unjudged and confessed. The righteous purifieth himself. That means that if you know there's something in your life that hinders you from producing more fruit or, to stop, or that is stopping you from being fruitful, what could that be? I'll give you an example. And, um, and I mean this, I'm not looking at anyone. I'm just telling you in my life, okay? There's many of things that can produce unfruitfulness. Um, or if you subject yourself under the Lord, you can be more fruitful. Um, and, and I'm just going to let the Lord deal with you on that. I'm not even going to go anywhere because I don't need to. All right. 
To remain in Christ is, on the one hand, to have no known sin unjudged or unconfessed. You know the areas in your life that you need to have worked on. Don't worry about the children. They're okay. <clears throat> um, it says, uh, I wrote, um, to remain in Christ is, on the one hand, to have no known sin unjudged and, and confessed in your life, no interest into which he has brought, um, no life which cannot uh, be shared, meaning that, I guess what I'm trying to say here is that if there's things that are hidden in your life, you need to deal with them. If you can't share it with somebody, it might be pornography. You need to deal with it. That is bad. Very. If it's drunkenness, you need to deal with it. If it's marijuana, you need to deal with it. All, there's so many things. If it's foul language, anything that you feel is causing a separation between you and God, you'll know instantly. You'll know what it is. Man, I don't know why I do this. You know, it's an area that you need to work on, doing something with. Um, in the Bible, fruit in our life is spoken of in four terms. And this is what it's spoken of. We can produce no fruit. We can produce fruit, it talks about. We can produce more fruit. This is all in John 15. And then number four, he talks about um, in verse 5 and 8 that he prunes it so that it will produce much fruit. Some pr people don't produce fruit at all. Some people produce little fruit. Some people produce more fruit. And some people produce much fruit. And it says, as it says in verse 5 through 8, as we bear much fruit, the Father is glorified in us. Amen. He's glorified in us that we produce more fruit. I mean, there's there is, you know, some serious times coming. Don't you want the maximum yield out of what you plant? Well, you are a plant in God's garden, and He wants the maximum productivity that He can get out of you. So you've got to submit unto the Master's hand, the great physician, to prune you so that you can produce much fruit. And in that, He is glorified. Amen. 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 Young will begin to produce fruit. Then will begin to produce more fruit. Then, listen, I'm not even saying I produce much fruit or more fruit. Because I don't even be prideful in that. All I know is I just want to be producing because any, produ any fruit, that any tree that does not produce fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Yeah. It says, as we bear much fruit, in verse 5 through 8, the Father is glorified in us. And also, I heard this, well, you know, in, in John chapter 15. Well, you know, and, and this is for me and this individual. Well, it, it's not talking about, you know, it's talking about being fruitful in your life. Well, yes, it is talking about being fruitful in your life, but in Romans... Chapter 1, verse 13, the fruit is also talked about as converts. Amen. Yeah. yeah, you could talk about having a fruitful life. Romans chapter 1, verse, uh, chap verse 13, you know, but also it means bringing others into the kingdom. Now listen, until you start producing Galatian fruit, which is the fruits of the Spirit, the nine fruits of the Spirit, Love, joy, health, peace, long-suffering, tenderness, kindness, mercy. He read them out. Uh, he went, in fact, Brother Carl went there last week in his uh, Galatians 5 or 4 or 5. He went to the fruits of the Spirit, chapter 5. You see, if you're not producing the fruit of Jesus Christ, love, joy, peace, tenderness, mercy, kindness, long-suffering, and all of these things, well then, you're not going to make converts. Right. Because it's from those fruits when you extend your goodness or the goodness of God to others, they're like, man, what is it that you got? I want it. Yeah. But if you're an old grump, That's right. if you're grumpy all the time and my <laughs> mahood and conscious, you know, you know how we are. <laughs> we are, we are. 
And the ones that are pointing fingers, you are too. <laughs> I am. I'm grumpy. Hey, you don't believe me? Ask my wife. Your wife will confess all your sins. <laughs> I'm not the good shepherd. I'm just a good shepherd. <laughs> Trying to be a better shepherd. And to produce, because it's what others see in your life. Yes. There's something different about that guy. There's something, and that's what it's about. It's not rotten fruit. <laughs> Jesus is telling his disciples this right before he dies. Yes. This is the Passover time. He's communing with them. Yes. The word is what? Washing them. Yes. Pruning them. Ooh. Before he leaves. Wow. Yes. He says, and you are pruned through my word. Yeah. Wow. I hate pruning. <laughs> because I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> you don't want the ministry of pruning. Because <laughs> you're going to get stuck. <laughs> you will. But you know, you got to realize what you're dealing with, what side you're dealing with, because it's flesh. But once the spirit, you know what? You were right. I'm going to use my brother. I told my brother not to do something, and he directly, outrightly done it. And I told him twice, don't do it. But then you know what? He called me up. Brother, I am so sorry. So sorry. You know, and that's what it's about. You know, once you've been pruned, you can see what it was that was growing off of you really wasn't good. Man. And you know what it's going to do? It's going to encourage you to do better. That's what pruning is going to do. There ain't no good time to prune. <laughs> Does anybody ever want to be pruned? No. no. Is there ever a good time to be pruned? To be talked about something in your life that needs to be dealt with? No. Well, brother, you know, I think it's a good time. <laughs> I don't think it's a good time. Why now? <laughs> and that would be, you could pick 365 days in a year. Any day you want to try to prune, mm -hmm. ain't going to be a good day. Because you're dealing with flesh. <laughs> you're dealing with flesh. Amen. But once it's pruned, oh, oh, I don't like the way you done it. Oh, you're bunching me. <laughs> I just barely caught it right there. What are you talking about? He hacked it off. <laughs> Next day, oh, you know, really, it's not a, it's not a big terrible skull. Oh, you know what? I think he was right. <laughs> I'm bleeding. Uh, the, you know the flash. Oh! It's so dramatic. That son of a gun took me back in a Woodstock and hacked me all up. Usually, that's the ones that leave. And really you didn't. You just went to him in love. Oh, you call that love? <laughs> you know? Well, you know, if here in the Word, please prune yourselves. Amen. Yes, Tony? Remember when I was pruned? Tell me. I don't remember. And I had run off. And I had that dirt on my head. Uh, <laughs> listen to Tony. Oh, no. Listen to my brother. <laughs> I want you to know where it is. Uh, <laughs> Brother Tony talking about ashes on his head. Remember when I was pruned? You pruned me with those ashes? I went to the word. You call it dirt. Why well, I did it, why well, I still do it. The word is fire. Man, listen to that. I got a new one too. Listen to that. You, you, you see that? You see that? That's amazing. You know, something that's dear in his life, something he's raised in, something he's, you know, and then he hears something about it. You know, it, oh, what? What does he do? He goes to the Word. And now he comes out and says, hey, I was pruned. Hey, I've been pruned many a times, you know. Hey, I had to look under the chair where I was at. Hold that thought. I'm done, and I'm going to come right to you. Listen to this. And I'm going to end with this. Check this out. Um, 
Um, in verse 5, 8, it talks about God wants us to produce much fruit. And fruit is people. Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 13. Christian character. Um, Christian character is a fruit of the Spirit. That's in Galatians 5. The fruits of righteousness it talks about in Romans 6. There's many fruits. Note, the progression of his disciples in chapter 13 through 15. Now he's about to die. From chapter 13 to 15, he's talking about he's about to die and he's, he's washing them in the word. He's pruning them. He says, he says, I'm telling you, note the progression of his disciples in chapter 13 through 15. They go from being third servants in chapter 13, verse 16. They were called servants to friends and brothers. The Bible says servants doesn't know what the master's doing. But he says, but friends and brothers. I call you no more servants, but friends and brothers. And friends and brothers know what it is the Lord's going to do. That's who we are. We're friends and brothers. Abraham was a friend of God. We're the friend of God. Amen. And he lets us know what's coming. Um, the Word of God is a mirror. Don't forget this. Check this out. And how is the Word of God a mirror? Well, I'm bringing you back to the tabernacle. The laver where the priests washed, it was made out of the looking glasses of women. It was the brazen laver filled with water. Water's the word, and on the inside was mirrors. The word of God is a mirror. It'll show you a reflection of who you are. It'll show you the dirt on you. You understand? Listen to this. So, the word is a mirror. No word, no mirror. You heard me? The word is a mirror. No word, no mirror. No mirror, no reflection. No reflection, you can't see yourself. If you can't see yourself, you're blind. Blind people fall in dishes, in ditches. Blind people fall in ditches. They cause accidents. They cause offenses. They get offended easily. They are unfruitful, fruitless. And because they cannot see, they usually blame others for their problems. They're easily spotted because they're not planted. Wow. They're easily spotted because they're not planted. That means when you go to prune a tree and a tree gets offended, you're trying to share something with that tree that needs to be dealt with. They don't allow it. They don't stay. So they leave with that bad fruit hanging on them and they bring it to another place. They cannot see. They usually blame others for their problems. They're easily spotted because they're not planted. And travel to every church gossiping about the one they just left. Mm -hmm. Paul says and describes them like this. They are wells of water, twice dead, plucked up by the root. There's a season and a time, I don't want you to misunderstand what I'm saying, that God will take you from one place and plant you in another one. You can be transplanted, but it's not going to be because of, or it's not going to be out of, man, I ain't staying at this church out of an offense. Okay. Usually, someone who is mature in the Lord knows God will, just like you go from, you know, I'm going to say kindergarten, K-I-D-N-E-Y, kidney, <laughs> not kinder, I was corrected on that, kindergarten, kindergarten to elementary school, to middle school, to high school, 
to okay. philosophizing, <laughs> to, you know, college. God does that. Sometimes one body can only take you so far. God will move you to another body. And you'll know. And it won't be out of anger. Uh, it's growth. Yeah. You know, spiritual maturity. Okay. So I'm going to leave you with this and then we go to Carol. That's what I was going to say. Oh, we're going to go with this and I'm going to come to Carolyn. Oh, okay. I said it low, I'm sorry. Um, you know, the most important thing that I'm going to leave with you again today is read. I gave, you know, I told some people, I told the church before I left, the week before I left, I said, read Philippians. I'm not even going to ask to raise a hand who read it. The week before I left, I said, read Galatians. And I'm not going to ask who read I'm going to start asking though. If I give you an assignment, I expect you to do it. And I'm going to hold you to it. Because it's only going to help you. So when I come back and I say, okay, last week I asked you guys to read Philippians, you know, three pages or four pages. I asked you to read Galatians, five or six pages. Why am I doing it? Because I want to see you become what it is that God has called you to be. You know, and let me tell you something. The other thing I put in here was that, you know, I need you strong. We need each other strong because the time that's coming, you know, we can't be worried about offenses. When we come together as a unit, as a family, we know each other. You know, if we don't agree with something, you know, I sat down, had a good talk with a brother when it was over with. We both understood it was perfect. We under, you know, that's, you got to be able to communicate. If something happens and that you can't communicate with a person, then you have no relationship. You know, especially what's what coming. I mean, they're saying this year the economy is definitely going to collapse this year. And they said it begins in March. Everything's going to start rolling downhill. When it comes, well, we all got to come together. Come on, brother. And we're living in one place. We can't be worried about, you know, you need to learn how to accept some things. And, you know, because we're all in different houses. Put a couple of people, different families in a house, and you'll see what it'll bring. <laughs> but you remember that we are all, you know, in the house of God. And we got to know how to be submitted. <laughs> To sub be able to submit one unto another. Subject, the Bible says, subject yourself one unto another. Let the prophet speak two or three and let the others judge. You know, if I, if I got an idea about something and, you know, we get a group of people together, men and women, and we talk about it, find out what's the best way. It ain't always going to be my way, you know, or it, maybe it might be in direction and what we need to do. You know? But it's going to be important when that time comes that we can trust one another. Right. Be able to live with one another. You know? That is more important than anything. That's more important. Because it's going to be tested and tried. You know, especially when those times come. Amen. So anyway, Father, let's pray and I'm going to let go to... to uh, uh, I keep wanting to say Cheryl, Carol. Sister. Anyway, let's pray. Father, you're so good, Lord. You're so amazing. And Father, ultimately, Lord, um, like your word says, that you are the gardener. You're the one that prunes the trees. Lord, your word prunes us. So Father, I'm praying, Lord, that um, we, have, we have a solid group, Lord. Man, we have, a, uh, we have an amazing group. Um, tree here as a unity, Father. You've uh, taught us and pruned us and, Lord, we're growing strong. And, Lord, I just ask, Father, that um, you would just help us so that we can support more fruit. So that we can support more fruit. You know, I understand now, Lord, why you cut the tops out of us and, you know, so the roots can grow deep. So that we all can come aboard and, and, and help serve, Lord, and um, so, Father, in this new year, Lord, we just ask you, Father, that for growth and uh, that we would produce uh, much fruit for your glory, Father, because that's truly what it's all about. Lord, I pray that you would fertilize and strengthen every tree that's in here, Lord. And uh, 
Lord, I thank you for them. They are a blessing to me, truly, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.